We'll open your Bibles with me to Genesis chapter 21. Genesis chapter 21. And we will be reading verses 22 through 34. Again, that's Genesis chapter 21, verses 22 through 34. Hear now God's word. At that time, Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his army, said to Abraham, God is with you in all that you do. Now, therefore, swear to me here by God that you will not deal falsely with me or with my descendants or with my posterity, but as I have dealt kindly with you, so you will deal with me and with the land where you have sojourned. And Abraham said, I will swear. And when, when Abraham reproved Abimelech about a well of water that Abimelech's servants had seized, Abimelech said, I do not know who has done this thing. You did not tell me, and I have not heard of it until today. So Abraham took sheep and oxen and gave them to Abimelech, and the two men made a covenant. Abraham set seven ewe lambs of the flock apart, and Abimelech said to Abraham, What is the meaning of these seven ewe lambs that you have set apart? He said, These seven ewe lambs you will take from my hand, that this may be a witness for me that I dug this well. Therefore, that place was called Beersheba, because there both of them swore an oath. So they made a covenant at Beersheba. Then Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his army, rose up and returned to the land of the Philistines. Abraham planted a Tamarisk tree in Beersheba and called there on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. And Abraham sojourned many days in the land of the Philistines. Bow your heads and pray with me. Heavenly Father, we do pray that you would open up this text to us this morning, that your spirit would illuminate it to us, that we would understand what it meant and what it means to us. Uh, Lord, I, I pray that you would use the preaching of your word to edify the saints today. And I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, this is not what you would call a very familiar text, right? This isn't the, the, the one that you go to, right, when you're, 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 you're thinking, oh yeah, I just need to read Abimelech and Abraham, right? <laughs> just, oh, that, that one, right? This is, this is not a familiar passage. And in fact, I was a little bit distraught as I looked through commentaries that skipped it. Or I looked at sermons by good reformed guys who just skipped this passage. And commentaries actually said that this passage, the word of God, that this passage is filler. It's just filler. You know, it's just a little glimpse into the everyday life of Abraham. It's not a big deal. But of course, this is God's word that we're speaking of this morning. There's a reason it's here. And so I want us to first get our bearings in the text to understand the context, why it's here, so that we can better understand as we get into the details uh, what this passage means and what it means to us. And so notice at the end of this passage, that Abimelech says to Abraham, here, you can have this well. He blesses him. He gives him this well that he's dug, gives it back to him, and he allows for Abraham to sojourn in the land. Look at chapter 20, the first time Abraham and Abimelech bump into each other. And of course, Abraham lies to Abimelech about Sarah, but you've already heard a sermon about that. Look at the very end of the passage in verse 15 of chapter 20. In Genesis, he says, And Abimelech said, Behold, my land is before you. Dwell where it pleases you. And right before this, he had just given, given him all of these material possessions. 
And so it ends in a very similar way. Both of our, our passage today and chapter 20, they're talking about two things specifically. Talking about Abraham's relation to the nations, the Gentile nations, and his relationship to the land, the promised land. Now these, of course, have to do with the covenant promises of our God. And notice that right before, directly before, and directly after our passage today, we have two very significant texts when it comes to the seed promise, right? We have the birth of Isaac, Ishmael being thrown out, and directly after our passage, we have the near sacrifice of Isaac, these passages about the seed, the land, the blessing, the seed, all of these covenant promises are woven together right in front of us with all of these passages. And so we don't have filler when it comes to our text. No, no, we have a passage that it directly relates to God working out his covenant promises right here in time and space. So look uh, with me as, as we look at this passage, now more specifically at our text, Notice that Abraham, and this is not always the case, this is not always the case because Abraham's a sinner, but in our passage, Abraham is acting faithfully. He's clinging to the covenant promises of God. And so as we walk through our text and we see fruit that Abraham shows, fruit that shows that he is clinging to the covenant promises of God, I want you to use that fruit as a, as a litmus test. For you to examine yourselves, are you brothers and sisters clinging to the sure promises of our everlasting God? Well, look with me at verses 22 through 24. In this opening section, you'll see two men set before us, Abimelech and Abraham. Let's look at Abimelech. Abimelech, this, this pagan, this unbeliever, comes to Abraham, and he comes to him pleading with him to be kind to him, to deal with him truthfully, as opposed to how he dealt with him in chapter 20, which was not truthful. And he, he, he's pleading him to, 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 to do that, but what does he say first? The first thing that he says is this, God is with you, Abraham, in all that you do. Abimelech knows God. He knows who he is. Not that he submits to him in faith, but he knows who he is, and he knows that he's with this guy, Abraham. But notice, who's right next to Abimelech? Fakol, the commander of his army. In, in Hebrew, the name Fakol means a wide, open, gaping mouth, okay? <laughs> right? But the connotation with this wide, open, gaping mouth violence, chaos. And so he comes with, with chaos and violence at his side. And he comes trying to get Abraham to, to, to deal with him truthfully, kindly. He knows that God's with him in all that he does. And yet if Abraham does not bow to this request, he's going to throw an army at him. Notice the nature of unbelief. That he knows God, and yet he is going to throw an army as if he can thwart God's plans, thwart the man of God. It's the nature of unbelief. He comes in fear, in fear, and he is going to irrationally act if Abraham does not comply. Okay? Now, there's our first man. But notice the difference between our first man with this spirit of fear and the spirit of peace that Abraham is showing in our text. Notice that his words are quite sparse in these opening verses. Look at verse 24. And Abraham said, and he's responding here to this plea for him to deal kindly with Abimelech. What does he say? I will swear. I will swear. His words are truthful. His words are definitive. His words show the spirit of security, of peace that Abraham has. It's so different from Abimelech with his spirit of fear. But not only that, it's different from who Abraham was in chapter 20 many years earlier when he first dealt with Abimelech. 
when he was so fearful that he lied about his own wife being his wife. What has happened in between this, between these texts? Something very significant. Look at it. The Lord has provided Isaac. He's provided an heir to the covenant. He is working out his, the Lord is working out his covenant promises and fulfilling them. And Abraham sees that. He recognizes it. He clings to it. And in our passage, he shows fruit of that faithfulness, of that clinging to the Lord's promises by definitively with a spirit of peace saying, yeah, I, I will swear. I'll make this covenant with you. Now, continue as, as we look on at verses 25 through 32. Yes, Abraham has said, yeah, I, I swear, I will make this covenant with you. But then he boldly approaches Abimelech. Notice again the difference between chapter 20 when he was so fearful he would not confront Abimelech and say, yes, she's my wife. And now he boldly confronts Abimelech. And what does he say? That's my well. And your servants have seized my well. We need to sort this out. You need to make this right, Abimelech. And so he goes to Abimelech in boldness, and Abimelech says, look, Abraham, I didn't know. I didn't know up until this point. You didn't tell me until now. And maybe he's telling the truth. I think he likely is. And Abraham, he continues on to go ahead and do what he swore that he would do. He makes the covenant. You see that in verse 27. They, they go about their business, Abraham and Abimelech. It seems like they both know what they're doing here. They're seasoned businessmen, if you, will, they, uh, if you will. They know what they're doing. But then Abraham does something that so throws Abimelech off. What does he do? Verse 28, Abraham set seven ewe lambs of the flock apart. And what does Abimelech do as Abraham brings out these little lammies? Well, Abimelech, what does he do? He steps back and he says, what's going on here? What's happening? Is there a hidden cost that I didn't know about in this covenant? And what does Abraham say? What are these lambs for? These seven lambs. Remember seven uh, pointing to fullness, completion. What does he say? He says, look, Abimelech, these lambs are witness that I can point to, that you can point to, and that we can know that that is my well. It's mine. And this is not a foreign concept. In other places in scripture, you'll see typically it's more of a stone structure or a wooden structure that, that people can point to and know, okay, that's, that's my land or, or, or that's my well, okay? This is not a, a foreign concept to us either. I have a, a Honda Civic sitting outside. That's my car. How do I know it's my car? Well, I can pull out the title, I can point to my name and say, that's my car. And in our classes, right, in our classes, we're getting our, our graded midterms back, right? And how, how does the professor know and how do I know which one is mine? We can point to the name on the test and say, that's my test. No matter what grade may be on it, that's <laughs> my test, okay? I have to claim that grade. But, but think, think about this in relation to our salvation, to our sonship, to the inheritance of the covenant. How do we know that it's ours? Well, we point to the singular lamb, the shed blood of the singular lamb, Jesus Christ, who seven completed, fulfilled the covenant promises made to Abraham on the cross and in his resurrection, he completed it. We point to it and we say, look, we come before the father in boldness and we say, look, it's mine. The covenant promises, they're mine. The inheritance, it's mine. And what do you think Jesus is doing right now as he intercedes for us right now at the right hand of the father? He's coming before the father and part of his intercession for us is that he comes with boldness to his father and he points to his completed work on the cross and he says, look, father, look, they're mine. They're mine. And he's pointing to you and that's what he's saying. You see, the work, the fulfilled, the completed work of Christ is the witness to the fact that not only are, 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 are the promises ours, not only is God our God, but he looks at us and he says, they're mine. 
And so we can come in boldness, whether it be horizontally with the world or even before the Father. We come in boldness, not because of what we have done, but because of the completed, fulfilled work of Jesus Christ. We can come with boldness. And so we see the second fruit that Abraham shows as he clings to the covenant promises of our everlasting God. Now let us move down and look at the rest of our passage at verses 33 and 34. At this point, Abimelech and Phicol have left the scene. The unbelievers are gone. Abraham has dealt horizontally with the world, but now it's time to get down to the real business. He's going to come before the God, before God in worship. And so he goes before the Lord in worship, and what's the first thing he does? He plants a tree, and this tree, it points to the blessings of God, not just, I think this is in mind, not just that the Lord has blessed Abraham that day, but that the Lord will bless Abraham by fulfilling finally his covenant promises in full. He knows that. How how do we know that? I think we know that his worship here is not only temporal in that time and space, but also forward-looking for two reasons. One, the tree, and two, the name. Okay? One, the tree, and two, the name. So the tree, he plants this tree, and think about it. Think about the two trees, okay? The tree of life that shows up in, in Genesis in the garden, and then the tree of life again that pops up in the new heavens, in the new earth. And in in Revelation, it would appear more clearly that that tree is pointing to, that that tree is Jesus Christ. And we have a tree here in our text, and I, I believe that it points forward to that final completion. And you might think, well, that's a stretch, but then it's not just the tree. What's the other one? The name. Well, look at the name that he uses as he plants this tree. He calls on the name of God. There on the name of the Lord, what does he call him? The everlasting God. The everlasting God of his everlasting covenant. It points to the end. As Hebrews 11 tells us, Abraham was looking to a city that had foundations, whose builder, whose designer is the Lord, is God. And so his worship, as he comes in joy, in exuberant joy, as he worships God, he rejoices in what the Lord is doing in fulfilling his covenant promises and in what he most assuredly will do in fulfilling his covenant promises. And so for us, this Sunday, when the saints are gathered in worship, when the officers of Christ's church lead us in worship, when we go to serve the Lord in worship and meet him there, and as he meets us in worship this Sunday, may you come with joy, knowing that the Lord God is fulfilling his promises. He has fulfilled his promises in Christ, and he will fulfill his promises in Christ. But the new heavens and the new earth when he sets everything right and all sin is done away with and he wipes every tear from your eye and you are with the Lord and he dwells, he tabernacles among among you in a way that, that we don't know yet, but we will know. It's sure for our everlasting God has promised it. And so, brothers and sisters, as you look at this text and you see these the fruit that flows from Abraham. Ask yourself, do you have joy in worship? Do you have boldness in this life, in your workplaces, in your ministries, with your families? And do you have that spirit of fear? Or do you have that spirit of joy? And know that you cannot merely try harder to have that fruit but rather it flows organically from you as it did from Abraham in our text today, as he typifies, as he pictures the faithful man, Jesus Christ. It flows from him naturally as he clings to the covenant promises of our everlasting God. So brothers and sisters, cling 
cling to those promises. And pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you that, Lord, you are an everlasting God. It's part of who you are. Lord God, you will fulfill your promises. You've shown pictures of it throughout all the Old Testament as we look at Isaac, as we look at this passage with the land and the blessing. You fulfilled your promises in Christ, and you will fulfill your promises in Christ. We know that, and as we sojourn in this world, may we cling to those promises, Lord God, and may fruit flow from it. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. We'll stand and we're going to sing Psalm 96D.